after a while, they brought my dad into the show, who was Les Dennis. Um, he was only there for a short time. Um, but yeah, it was nice to work with Les in that short space of time. I'm sure I have told you some groundbreaking advice. Of course, you always you It's always about me. Of course you do. I wanted to do, and Terry Dwyer, who was in Hollyoaks, wanted to do, because we thought the girls should have done it, because we did all the other tasks, and it should have been me and her against each other. Okay. But I don't want to be mean. I want to help this person. But all of a sudden, my stress container is filling up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to struggle and I'm going to start to overflow, but really I want to help this person. Maybe this person just needs someone to talk to because maybe they're lonely. They've got nobody at home. Welcome to Mamwa. I'm Gordy Camp, your host, and this is the podcast that includes you into my most famous song lyrics. He's a middle-aged man with an attitude, and he didn't even have one till he met you. That's right, I'm the middle-aged man, and my attitude will chatter us through all things that I'm passionate about, from spirituality, the gym and fitness, food, traveling, and music or movies. Quick disclaimer, this list is not exhaustive. So you can get on or you can get off and join us for the episodes that you like the sounds of. Dip in or dip out, as long as you keep dipping. Either way, we've got something to say and we're going in three, two, one of the things that we all strive for. Tenacity or drive or ambition or motivation or all of them. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Gordy Camp, and today on Mamba, we have lots to talk about and we hope that you will get lots of ideas and motivation to move forward in your goals, and think about your drive to improve your success and your wellness. We are joined by my good mate, Anne-Marie Davies, who you guys might know from a few TV shows, films, or even radio. We will get into that in just a moment. But firstly, thank you, Anne, for joining us today. How are you? I'm good. It's lovely to see you, Gordon, after all these years. I know. It's been a a minute, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. You've moved recently. How's your stress levels? (laughs) Oh, gosh, stress levels are through the roof. Uh, you know, this is audio, but if you can see actually behind me, I have no lights or soft furnishings. So they are to come. But that's the least of my worries right now. But yeah, it's all it's all good. I've moved back up to the Wirral, back to my old sort of stomping ground, as they'd say. So it's been really great bumping into old people, familiar faces. Going the coast, which has been great because I've been living down in... Uh, Milton Keynes for coming up to about 15 years. So Milton Keynes is slap bang in the middle of the country, the furthest away from any coastline. So I'm delighted to be back near the sea. Yeah, good. You'll need the salt air. And in, in regards to your stress levels, you don't need to worry because you've got a business to deal with all this. And we'll get into that in <laughs> just a bit. Um, but I am really excited to get into everything that we're going to talk about today. So for the listeners... Anne and I worked together for a number of years. We were presenting growth mindset um, sessions and aspirational sessions. So if you guys have been following the show, you will know a bit more about that already. And you've probably heard me talk a lot about some of that stuff already. Um, But for now, let's just go back in time for a minute, Anne. Um, Because going back to things like the performance and the auditioning, um, that I've spoke to the guys before and I've had a few guests on who, who've talked about performance um, but it does develop a lot of skills in resilience and mm-hmm. how to get used to being knocked down or turned away um, so how did the early days of performance help you to kind of move forward in business firstly? Oh, that's a good question Gordon <laughs> um, I think so going back to sort of you know, the early days of acting, I think that comes part and parcel of and the nature of the job, really, um, which I think at, through time, that just come through, I say, practice of failing, <laughs> practicing of not getting the roles, as I would say, um, which enabled you to be more resilient and say, well, actually, you know, what, what maybe I've done wrong or how could I improve? But then equally, particularly with acting, it might be that your face just doesn't fit. You know, it could be you don't look like maybe a member of the family that they're casting for, or it's just not, a, you know, as I say, it's just not a good fit. So I think it took a while to get my head around that. Um, and of course, there were some additions when, you know, I used to spend hours traveling into London when I lived in Liverpool. And, you know, I'd literally walk in the door, and it'd be like, um, 
you know, like a 30 second sort of audition. And then I'd sit back on the train for like another three hour journey and think, gosh, you could have done that so much better, but you've only got one shot. And I think the more times you sort of get it wrong, the more preparation you do. Yeah. Um, but sometimes even though I did prepare, it was a bit of a disaster, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I always remember there was a an advert I went for. It was years ago, and it was um it was Vanish Oxy Action Max Multi. And it was a bit of a tongue twister. And it was, I even remember today, it was today, the new Vanish Oxy Action Max Multi <laughs> tells the ultimate stay and said, just go to bed. Two scoops in your wash. And like for the love of me, I just couldn't get the words out. I remember sitting on the train for that long journey home going, today, the new Vanish Oxy Action Max, and I could say it, but you just got that one shot. And you know, you can prepare and you can do all the groundwork, but sometimes things just don't go your way. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like that one haunted you. It did. <laughs> it's still with you now. It's still with me. <laughs> um, so when you did get the work, then you ended up um People our age will know of this, but Brookside on Channel 4, mm -hmm. you did a good stint on Brookside um, working with people like Les Dennis. How was that? Yeah, I mean, um, this was a very, very interesting time of my life, a very fortunate time to work with some amazing people, amazing directors, amazing actors, having that sort of, sort of, thrown in the deep end I would sort of say you know I was at college doing drama um then I went and sort of did some sort of short films and loads of free stuff to be honest everything that I did was like can you do this no pay no pay and then in the end it was like you sort of build up your sort of show reel mm -hmm. and your experience um and then they were looking for a new family in Brookside and when I got there there were hundreds probably thousands of people for the audition um fortunately enough I got down to the next sort of stage of auditions I got three recalls back so I kept going back and going back and then got down to seven and then we did loads of workshops and then got down to three and then um got the role of Katrina Evans which um which was which was amazing because I was only supposed to be there for a three months recurring contract and he ended up being there just short of four years so that was the best training for me, you know, learning about camera shots, learning, you know, different people's acting styles and uh, movements, you know, different directors. It was amazing. And after a while, they brought my dad into the show, who was Les Dennis. Um, he was only there for a short time. Um, but yeah, it was nice to work with Les in that short space of time. Yeah. He was there, yeah. And talking about things like camera shots, we've we've had a couple of guests on from Coronation Street um, and mm -hmm. Doctors. And I know you were on Doctors as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the, we had these conversations about the, the turnover um, and having that learning curve based on like things like drama school or theatre work mm -hmm. and having such a big learning curve about the turnover of, mm -hmm. of schedules and shots and stuff. Um, so talking about lines, you probably had to learn lines really quickly. <laughs> Never mind the hours on the train. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we did actually, because it was like a very quick turnaround. And um also as well, well, it's now line pictures, it was Mersey Television, Mersey TV. Um, we used to just run on one camera. So I suppose now, it, well, even back then, I know like of Coronation Street, they had multi-cameras. So as an actor or actress, it was, um, that was a big challenge, but it really made you think about the way you were delivering your lines. One for continuity, you know, your movement and everything, because we were just doing like maybe one big camera shot and then they come in for a more of a, you know, mid shot or close up shot. You'd have to remember your hand movements. If say you were drying your hands on a tea towel, um, where you picked up the cup, <laughs> you know, it was just really, really, it wasn't just like you could just act. Yeah. It was also thinking about when did I pick up that tea towel? When did I say that line? Yeah. When did I put my hand by my face? Or, you know, so that was a skill in itself, which I had to sort of learn very, very quickly. And, you know, I never did theatre. I did, you know, did stuff at college. But then when I left Brookside and went off to do theatre, 
that was a whole new world, completely different to television, completely different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's very, uh, very interesting times, but, but difficult looking back. It's like, oh, it'd be a breeze now, multi cameras and not thinking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, I see that you went from Channel 4 to BBC Heartbeat Doctors. Um, so did, do you feel that Brookside kind of assisted you? to get through the camera auditions much better as well. Massively. Yeah. Massively, yeah. I think the train, I think being, working with such fantastic actors and directors, I think that was a huge, huge learning curve for me, learning on the job, learning from other people. And obviously, you know, with the four years of experience, I suppose working in such a, a high profile soap, you know, it probably did give me that sort of credibility and experience. Yeah. Uh, to work for you know BBC Doctors and also for Heartbeat. I mean, I only did a couple of episodes, but it was very, it was great because it was different characters. You know, it was it was brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I love playing different characters. The stints that you were doing around that time, I believe that led to a short stint in celebrity reality TV, Fear Factor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What, yes. What was the scariest thing you had to do on that show? Because I remember that show so well. Yeah. It used to grip um, me. Wow, gosh, I was, yeah, I look, I've, I've actually looked at that video not long ago. Uh, I look very young. Um, it was all for charity. It was fantastic. Went to Cape Town. Um, the the little stunts that we had to do, That well, I say stunts. The first one was pretty scary um we got taken up to the top of a big power station cooling tower um in cape town so we were like on ropes so we had to climb across the 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 sort of cooling tower so you can imagine you know those big mushroom buildings that you yeah. see um and you could just see people at the bottom who were like really really tiny i had a helmet on you may have seen the youtube video uh the helmet was too big for me and all you see me is uh extremely out of breath going I need to go to the gym more um even though I was younger I was I thought I was fit but that was a, a real real challenge the ropes were moving my helmet was too big and uh, the second challenge I did it or we, we all did it and uh, the second challenge was maggots maggots in a massive tank well a big tank with chickens heads and chickens feet and you have to get them out with your mouth um and a couple of the guys didn't do it so when we come to the last sort of uh, challenge, which I really wanted to do because it was like something off James Bond. It was, you know, you were in the middle of mountains. You had to go on a jet ski, onto the back of a car going there, into a helicopter, fly around the lake and jump off into a big fear factor sign in the middle of this big lake, which I wanted to do. And Terry Dwyer, who was in Hollyoaks, wanted to do because we thought the girl should have done it because we did all the other tasks and it should have been me and her against each other. Okay. But um, I just don't think I was assertive enough back then, Gordon. I was young and there was a lot of characters in my team and I just was like, oh, do you know what? Just go and do it. But now looking back, I should have fought for that place. But then I think, it. like, talking about fear, the, uh, just for the listeners, Anne and I were talking about this time when we went to Go Ape up in Scotland and Air. Oh, yes. And that... Uh, the, if anyone, anyone listening has ever been on this, it's, I would say, about a thousand meter zip line. And it's above all these trees. And I cried the whole bloody time. <laughs> <laughs> I was petrified. Um, but, but I did it because everyone else had already done it. And I was just absolutely shitting myself. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think when you're in those situations, it's, completely different ball game isn't it there's just yeah. so much to and I think when I was younger I, I had no fear I think now you know I'm well I'm getting on a little bit um I think I, I haven't got I used to have no fear I think as I've got older I'm more oh I'm not sure about that yeah. oh, I think I've lost that sort of free spirit like not bothered I think maybe because I've got well I've got an 18 year old daughter so maybe I don't know whether that comes just with having family or age, or you're just more mindful of maybe the consequences. Yeah, I think that's it. I know for me, like I, I'm so aware of my age getting mm. further and further away from me. 
Um, and I'm like, I don't know how long I've got left. I just need to be careful all the time now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that going back to like success, I think that can sometimes hold you back as well, can it? Um, yeah. It just stops you from doing more things in life. But yeah, so you had a transition from the television and you've, I think you had a, re- a radio show well, on KFM, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, well, I moved to Milton Keynes um, when my daughter was about four. So um, I didn't know anybody in Milton Keynes. Um, I sort of built up a network of friends, got friendly with people from MKFM. Um, love radio, love creative, love, I love the sort of that inside of, you know, things. And they invited me to come and do, um, it was like an evening show, but it was pre-recorded. So I used to go in the day and sort of pre-record it um I didn't do it for that long I probably did it for about six months um but it just became a bit of a challenge because pick picking jazz and up from school and you know it just took a lot of time so but I enjoyed it there it was really great yeah, yeah it is was, it something you would do again radio I would yeah I would definitely do it again I think because of the time of the show it was more welcome to night MKFM you're with me I'm, it was all very low key whereas I, you know me Gordon I yeah, like yeah. energy and I thought maybe my maybe let's play it that way rather than hey <laughs> wake, <laughs> when up. People, wake up when people are driving home at like 10 o'clock at night <laughs> it's the night hour <laughs> and then so what's what, the process to get into radio as opposed to getting into like the performance side Mm-hmm. Was there anything specific that they looked for for radio presenting? No, I think that's because I've sort of done quite a lot of charity work with them and I built up a good relationship. And I think that's when they, you know, I just sort of may have asked them, you know, is there anything that, you know, you could teach me? It was, you know, I'd never been to radio school or mm-hmm. had, you know, I've done I've done loads of interviews over the past, you know, through sort of the Brookside days up in, um, the Radio City Tower and you know back in the day I was always in a radio station promoting what was you know coming up on the shows etc but actually being a presenter on the radio show there was nothing in the, nothing in particular that they asked they just sort of kindly said how do you feel about doing this and I was like I absolutely love to and I, and I love about taking opportunities because yeah. you know we both we both understand that you don't know where it might lead you um and yeah, I, you know, it wasn't something where I learned, I did learn some skills, you know, it was all the recording and stuff. So it wasn't live. I didn't learn all the desks, you know, how you swap and change and do all the, the buttons. But um, I really wanted to do that. But I just don't think there was enough time in their schedule to sit back and train me. So I think I just sort of, I would say, filled in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about networking then, is there any, I would, I'm going to say top tips for anyone listening who wants to kind of make those connections in radio? What would you say right to now. people who want to get into that? I just think with anything, whether it's radio, business, whatever it may be, you know, you're not going to make those connections just sitting at home, scrolling through Instagram. Or you might, because that's the way of the world, I suppose. Yeah. But I think genuine human connection, you can't beat it. You know, getting yourself out there, seeing what's, you know, what events are going on. Um, gosh, I used to write loads of letters, you know, about is there any productions happening? And and I think back in my day, I think people used to get that many letters that I think people just didn't read them. But I think we've sort of reverted back to actually people have lost that connection. And I think maybe just taking a chance and just writing to people and, you know, doing something a bit more personal. Yeah. People will probably take more notes. Um, but I think sort of that connection and meeting people face to face, you can't beat it. Building those connections, isn't it, and relationships. Yeah. And getting them to know who you are, being, you know, your authentic self. Don't try and fit into somebody else and go, oh, they're doing that, so I must follow them. Mm-hmm. Just be yourself, you know. That's what I what I can say. Words of wisdom there, Gordon. Yeah. I don't know how it's got no, it is. I think it is because online, talking about things like Instagram, the the whole I'm going to use air quotes for anyone who can't see this, but um, influencer trends mm. is they're putting on a show 
just as much as somebody doing a performance. So mm -hmm. if anyone's reaching out for influencers to do stuff, they never really get what their work ethic is. They never really know what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. So they need to network just as much as it is the next person. Mm -hmm. So I think you're completely right there. It is words of wisdom. Going from that then into being a business leader. Uh -huh. um, you had the Dress Empire, Milton Keynes. Yeah. And you also started BMR. So did they run hand in hand? There's a bit of a story here going on. Oh, might please tell long. us. It might be a bit, a bit, a bit <coughs> long. But I'll find it a very condensed version. You know me. Um, so the Dress Empire just came about because I used to do beauty pageants and I've been doing them since I was sort of 18. Um, and then sort of went off and did a few of the Mrs. Ones, the older ones, classic um, competitions. And I just found it really tricky to find a really nice evening dress. And in Milton Keynes, there was nothing around. And then I'd worked in schools quite a lot and recognised there was always proms and there wasn't a great deal of options in Milton Keynes. So I started off quite small and then created the Dress Empire which was lovely. I created a good experience for you know people to come, try dresses on. But it was just at the turning point when everybody started to buy online. Um, so it's like people come in, have a great afternoon. Thank you for your service. They'd walk away. They'd know what colour, what size, what style. Uh, and then they'd go and buy from China or they'd go online. And then a couple of weeks later, they'd come back and go, oh, that was terrible. I bought this from such and such and it was the wrong size or so it was part of an experience but then people always went online and that was the turning point so there was no it just became it it just became a waste of time okay <laughs> but it wasn't being my passion I just thought there was a little little niche in the market and I think as well it was so expensive for renting in Milton Keynes Shopping Centre that you had to be out of the main footfall. So where I could afford the rent, the footfall wasn't great as well. Okay. So that was a bit of a learning curve. But Did you transition yeah. on to online sales then? Um, a little bit, but I just got I just got fed up of of doing it really because it wasn't really my passion. It really wasn't my passion. And it was difficult because Jasmine was at school. So I used to do like appointments around her. I'd take her to school, come to the shop, go and pick her up from school, take her back to the shop. And, you know, juggling being a mum, it was it was difficult. So, you know, I just thought, you know what, this is not making any money. It's looking at the time and put effort and putting into it. If I had a big marketing budget, maybe it might have been different. But I was a one-man band. So that was a uh, uh, sort of... I was sitting there with my friend, who's now my business partner. This is the transition to BMR. And she worked in corporate for a number of years. Um, and she was managing probably about 15 people in her team. Okay. And she was supported a couple of people in the team back then. And she just felt like she wasn't being supported in terms of how to manage people's sort of health and well-being. Yeah. Like, it was like, oh, so and has got a problem. Let's just put them in the corner and keep them happy. It wasn't a supportive environment. So um, no, she was going B through a BMR bit. is Body Mind Reboot. Well, that's okay. how we started, Gordon. Okay. Yeah. This is how, how we started with Body and Mind Reboot. So she had a felt like she wasn't being supported by the organisation she was working for. She um, was going through a few it, sort of um, not sleeping well, stress. It was work-related stress. So she took herself off to a boot camp. She absolutely loved it. She was away for a week. She come back absolutely revitalized, you know, got good sleep, good nutrition, um, that time away from that stressful environment in the workplace. And then sooner but later, it all just went back on that hamster wheel, you know, back on the hamster wheel of life, the stress, the work, the da-da-da, being away from home. She had a young boy at home, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then she was like, I need to go back to my happy place, which was boot camp. So she went again. And then while she was away, funny enough, she was there because I used to talk to her, funny enough, Gordon, about growth mindset yeah. when we used to work together, uh, about stepping outside your comfort zone. If you always do what you're going to, you know, you're going to get what you always got, so to speak. Um, I'm trying to sort of quickly tell this story. And um, she was away in boot camp and she was just thought, 
I don't want to do my job anymore. I've been there for, say, I can't remember, 20 years. I've always done the same thing. I've never done what Anne said, took, you know, step outside my comfort zone. I've been stuck in the same situation. And then she said, she come back to boot camp, she said, I'm not going back to work. Um, told her partner at the time, I'm not going back, not tomorrow, not the next day, I'm not going back. Um, so that was that. And then she so said how to long, me, how long were these boot camps that she went on? Because there's people listening to this and they're probably thinking, I think about that every day. I think about just not going into work every day. So how, yeah. when she goes away to get that kind of re, I don't know, invigoration from something else, mm-hmm. how long was she going away for? A week. A week, okay. A week. So it's just having that safe space, head space, just to think and not be on that stressful hamster wheel. So anyway, um, she come, she come back and I remember sit, sitting in the Dress Empire with me and she said, do you want to set up a business? And I was like, oh gosh, absolutely not. I'm trying to get out of this business because it wasn't financially working. And then, um, and she said, how do you feel about setting up a boot camp? You know, with your growth mindset stuff, you know, I, I played volleyball for England. I'm quite sporty. I know a bit about the, you know, the business. Um, and I thought about it and then literally... Within that evening, I probably sent her about 10 emails because I did a bit of research. I was like, okay. So that's when Body and Mind Reboot was born. And that's um, like you get so many ideas when you're researching. So you must yeah. have been like, what about this? What about this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm like you, Gordon. I'm, you know, give me some space and my creative energy flows. Yeah. It sounds a bit like that, doesn't it? Yeah, and it doesn't um, stop sometimes. It just keeps yeah. going. It keeps going. Yeah. So that's that's how we started, and we just called them Reboot Weekends, so okay. Body and Mind Reboot BMR. But we sort of evolved very, very quickly. We did it for a couple of years, and we created such a safe environment where people were talking to us about, you know, work-related issues, life events that maybe they'd gone through, you know, divorce or bereavements, um, huge life events. And we, we just found that people were opening up because there was a lot of people coming together who were strangers. So it's a lot easier to talk to strangers than it is maybe a family member then we soon established that mental health and physical health are very very intertwined so that's when I trained to become a mental health first aid England instructor um and we sort of incorporated the sort of um the mental health side of things getting people more mentally health aware uh getting in tune with their bodies um and we just created some fantastic weekends we started off doing a week but then we we adapted it to do sort of a long weekend Friday to Monday so people could you know if they were working Monday to Friday they could attend maybe three or four times a year and break up that was like a quick reboot yeah um which people loved but then sadly COVID hit and we just couldn't keep up the momentum because we were planning then it was like people were scared to come because of what's happening and we were like this is just you know very stressful so then we sort of transitioned more into the corporate side of things um and then we moved away from body and mind reboot to still bmr um and we were we sort of used that bmr health and well-being as our sort of new business name Mm -hmm. Uh, so BMR Health and Wellbeing, and we were like, what does the BMR stand for? Because it can't be Body and Mind Reboot, we're more uh, we're different now. So we said building mental resilience. But then we've sort of evolved since then because we what we established is with mental health, it's beyond mental resilience. You can have resilience to overcome challenges, but sometimes it goes beyond that because let's say... Yeah it's work-related stress you can have all the resilience in the world but if your boss keeps putting workload on you you know (laughs) you can be the resilient most resilient and just a no 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 you know so um so now we work with organizations um so it is beyond body and beyond mental resilience so bmr health and well-being but we're a bit of a one-stop shop for well-being so we look at all psychological health and safety I deliver mental health first aid England sessions, the uh, suicide first aid instructor as well. Um, we are partnered with Hempit Menopause in the Workplace, um, Thrive, which is around neurodiversity, uh, men's health, women's health, transgender awareness. We do lunch and learns on all different topics in the wellbeing space. So we've got like a network of 
experts within our team. So we are like a bit of a one-stop shop. And that's where we've sort of got to really after yeah. sort of probably about five years now. We've sort of completely evolved from our lovely little boot camps we used to do in Body Mind Reboot uh, and evolved to sort of the be more health and well-being. And do you think that will you'll ever revisit that as part of your current structure yeah 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 we have been thinking about that we've been looking at um you know we we still would offer like you know corporate team building events um because i think they're important as well but equally for individuals to come away uh we have been toying with the idea potentially in spain um and you know contacting our old clients and having like a bit of a get together but also as well maybe moving forward but we which is good. We are very busy because um, we're we're a small team. I'm actually just trained to be a counsellor, Gordon, and I'm in my final year to be a psychotherapist and moved home and trying to run a business. So, you know, my stress levels, even though I'm in the wellbeing space, are increasing slightly. I think you need you a week reboot off. session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's Sheila... Um, the mental health leads who came from BBC? No, that's Dr. Jackie Wilmshurst. So Sheila Lord is my business partner who uh, came up with, um, you know, do you want to set up a retreat? That's where we first started. Then we sort of evolved. She's my best friend. And then through our sort of journey, Sheila connected with uh, Dr. Jackie Wilmshurst on LinkedIn because Sheila's quite, um, she's got quite a lot of followers on LinkedIn, Sheila. Uh, but connected with Jackie through COVID okay. and it's all around psychological health and safety and they were like oh my goodness you know you're we're both on the same page you know it's a lot of people are well they're doing workplace well-being but they're not thinking about the preventative approach it's like oh we've got an issue go and speak to a mental health first aider mm-hmm. or go and speak to a counsellor or you know speak to e- employee assistance program which is the counselling it's not looking at what is causing this stress in the first place? Is it individual factors or is it work-related issues, which as an organisation, you've got a duty of care under the Health and Safety Act to protect your employees. Um, so it's about look at that preventative ap- approach rather than reactive. Yeah, yeah. So it's identifying what are the psychological risks in the workplace. But Sheila met uh, Jackie, and Jackie is the most incredible woman. Um, she Her wealth of knowledge is just she's super interesting knowledgeable uh, and we're so lucky to have her sort of um working with us she was the head of well-being at the bbc and also worked for tiktok as well so okay. um she knows her stuff and she's a very very interesting lady she's flown helicopters in the military she's chased cyclones she uh she's she's a very interesting woman and she rescues Squirrels, which is the complete opposite when you think she's been in high impact sort of war zones and, you know, really high risk environments. And then she looks after squirrels and it's just like, wow, Jackie, you're an awesome lady. I try and rescue the squirrels in my garden all the time. They just don't come to me. (laughs) I don't think they need rescued, (coughs) but I'd like to keep them all. Um, I was going to say something really maybe not inappropriate then. I was going to say... Well, no, I won't say it. <laughs> no. Um, no, I won't say it. <laughs> so what kind of organisations are you guys working with then? Organisations from education to um, gyms, uh, tech companies, um, Dobby's Garden Centre. I love it. Um, th- we've worked with football clubs, organisations of all sizes, really, Um that want to sort of create and develop their learning development programs uh, that they can empower people to become better at being them and the work and the relationships and in the wider world. So any organisations really that we work with, but some of the big, bigger ones we've worked with, um, some football clubs, uh, Energy Fitness, which is a huge gym franchise. So we do their wellbeing programme also as well, uh, food manufacturers, so... Cranswick Foods, which is in Milton Keynes, they're a big food manufacturers. Mm-hmm. It's a bird's eye over um Love a bit of chicken. <laughs> over Norfolk. It was quite interesting, yeah. It was 
yeah, bird's eye, Captain Bird's eye. Brilliant. Yeah. So you, you mentioned learning lunch. So do you do like bite-sized sessions and longer sessions? What's the kind of scale of the sessions that you guys run? Well, they're called lunch and learn, so just slightly different. Lunch and learn, so it enables people that if they want to on a lunch break, I mean, everybody wants a lunch break, right? But we do the educational part, so people want to find out a little bit more about stress awareness okay. or women's health or, you know, um, menopause awareness or neurodiversity awareness training or whatever it may be. We work with organisations that they put, in their well-being calendar throughout the year so typically organizations may choose for a year so then their employees can log on sometimes they're recorded so employees can catch up with them maybe not on the lunch but mm -hmm. it's just like an educational piece uh, so everybody has that basic sort of level of understanding really um so what we find is people do the education bit think of it as like two bookends the education bit the end bit being the counseling and the oh, someone's hurt themselves psychologically, we need to pick them back up. But it's the middle bit that we sort of focus on as well. So identifying the stresses in the workplace. And then I believe you also cover things like diversity, equality, inclusion, the risks around that. Mm -hmm. So based on the work that you guys do, what do you see as the biggest trends in those risks within, within just the workplace, let's say? I think meeting, because everyone's different. Um, I believe it comes down to communication and being part of an organisation where you feel valued and um, people feel heard. What do they need to do their job? So people are employed in a particular job role. You're employed to do that, but in terms of inclusion, diversity, equity, and all the whole sort of piece around that, you know, it could be somebody may be neurodiverse and they may need reasonable adjustments, but if they don't feel uh, if there's if they feel confident enough to break down any barriers of being supported to do that job role, it's about empowering people and it's about supporting people on their strengths, not the weaknesses. So, you know, somebody might be more creative or somebody might be more into numbers or we're just all very slightly different. So it's about including people and providing what they need to do the job role. And sometimes, you know, maybe the job isn't the right job role for that person, you know, and sometimes mm. it's just not a good fit. But at the end of the day, we're all human, aren't we? And it's about working together, having a safe and happy environment where we can all thrive. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's a... The reason I would kind of bring this area up specifically is there is a thin line with some leaders um, mm -hmm. in organisations because when they've got these opportunities that come come forward, when they're looking at a team, like they've got an unconscious bias of Absolutely. people in their team mm -hmm. and they might think, oh, well, John can't do that because he's got such and such going on at home. Jane can't do that because she she's got a bad back. And it's like it, what like these leaders need to also. I don't want to use the word tick boxes, but they need to be very much aware that mm -hmm. just because we're different doesn't necessarily mean that you can box people into a certain area okay. based on what's happening outside the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not always their call to make. Individuals. Maybe that comes back to the, the education, that, that you know, maybe that lack of knowledge and understanding. Mm. People going, oh, I didn't think of it like that. Yeah. Because the way society puts people in boxes. Literally, yeah. <laughs> I think you need to be more open-minded. And as a good leader and a good manager, you know, line manager, what have you, it's like, okay, let's communicate. What do you need, Gordon, to do your job to the best of your ability? What reasonable adjustments can mm -hmm. I do? To support you just because you may think slightly different or do things in a different way doesn't mean that you're not going to get to the same result however obviously if you're in a business where it is you know around security or you know money where it you know yeah. can go wrong then obviously you need the right people for the right job but what does that person need to fulfill that job role and sometimes it may not be a right fit but I think coming back to good leaders is knowing your team knowing what people need what do they want rather than us assuming we know what they want. Mm -hmm. It's about asking, yeah. asking the right questions, 
um, and making them feel valued. I think, you know, we all want to feel valued, don't we? I love I mean, feeling valued. <laughs> you, it makes you want to do more, doesn't it? It makes you want to do more for that person. Yeah. If no one values you, it's like, oh, well, I'm bothering. I'm not going to stay that extra 10 minutes and feel, you know, do that or have someone else's back. Yeah. You know, there's so many other things that come into play, isn't it? You know, yeah. the employability quality, is it teamwork or is it going off on your own and doing it individually, uh, cooperation, communication? Yeah. There's a lot of factors. And there's a lot, not just about leaders, but for individuals, like we have a responsibility to look after our well-being as well in those mm-hmm. situations what do you think we should be doing more of to look after our own well-being in those situations making sure that you have your boundaries in place so i have been working with a lot of teachers who also are let's say for example um working with people that are saying mental health, they're mental health first aiders as well. And then all of a sudden their stress levels are increasing because, you know, Joe Bloggs is knocking on the door every five minutes and they're trying to do their job. And then it's like, well, you know, I'm employed to do my job, but I've got this other hat on here. I don't want to be mean. I want to help this person. But all of a sudden my stress container is filling up. Mm-hmm. I'm going to struggle and I'm going to start to overflow. But really I want to help this person. Maybe this person just needs someone to talk to because maybe they're lonely. They've got nobody at home that feels they've got empathy from Joe Bloggs, who's the mental health first aider. And it's like, I think boundaries are super important, I think, in in life. You know, it doesn't mean if you put your boundaries in place, that means you're not a kind person. Yeah. It's about protecting your own mental health by, you know, taking your breaks. You know, as you know, run my own business. I sometimes need to take a leaf out my own book. You know, it's about, (laughs) there's always an email, there's always something to do. And all of a sudden, I'm feeling I'm running at full capacity, but it's about being more aware, being more mindful of how my thinking and feeling and behaving today. And I'm taking your breaks, you know, being honest. Actually, this is a little bit too much of me right now. I need to, you know, take a step back, putting your boundaries in place. Sometimes it's okay to say no to people. Yeah. And I think for us, we've been leaders for quite some time. But what would you say, like, to people who want to develop these skills, who don't have the experience that we've got to be resilient and know when we're kind of in that situation, what skills do you think people who need that should be focused on and how can they develop that more? I just think by exploring and confidence, you know, the more you do things, the more you build your toolkit up, you will more confident in whatever it is you decide to do practice um just just educating yourself and and find out what people are doing you know as I say don't go and you know copy other people but it's about it's building up your own toolkit for what works for you yeah how you can be a better leader speaking to people what do they need for you to be better at your job role it's working together that's what that's what I would think maybe that's I know that's the right why no well i had a conversation um with one of our other guests a few weeks ago and we were talking about not i don't like using the word selfish but not being selfish but being more self-aware so that when somebody's asking you for things Mm -hmm. that you you become more able to say let me go and check and i'll get back to you Mm -hmm. am i capable of it do i have the resource to do that and if you don't Maybe you only have half that time available to, to help them. It's Or it's okay to say, actually, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what I used to do when I was younger. I'd be like, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Oh, gosh, you know what I mean? And I yeah. think that, I think being more assertive comes with practice because I still struggle sometimes about being, oh, I think I want to say that I'm confident, but I haven't got the assertiveness to say it. Yeah. Oh, I'm still scared about what they might say. You know, because yeah. I'm a bit of a warrior. But I think that's just people's different one personalities, different experiences. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think just I'll go and find out about that and get back to you. Because we're human, we don't know everything. There are people that know more stuff than me and you. Um, if we're all the same, we'd all be, be quite boring, wouldn't it? It would. 
You've been around a lot of successful circles over the years. What's been the most groundbreaking ideas or advice that you've heard from people in that time? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm sure I I've told you some groundbreaking advice. Of course, <laughs> you always, you always It's always about me. <laughs> of course you do. Um, do you know what? I, I can't think of anything really in particular. I think I've just, I don't want to say, I think it's just the more people I connect with, the more I learn from other people. I like, I like people. I'm quite fascinated with people. Yeah. You know, people's stories, people's ideas, the different personalities. And I think, I don't know, I just think for me, it's put myself in situations where I'm going to meet new people because you you never know who knows who yeah. or what you're going to learn. I love learning. I think, um, not going to lie, can't wait till February till I finish my psychotherapy. <laughs> Just want a break. Quite tricky, wasn't it? Well, I, I, think that, I think that's what you've said can be groundbreaking itself because without doing that, like you said earlier, and it, I've been thinking about it for about half an hour now. If you're sitting at home scrolling on Instagram, you're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And I think doing is what gets you most of what we've spoke about. Meet new people, gain a skill, get a new qualification. Develop, 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 learn, learn, learn. I, I don't know, like, I've read a few self development books over the years, and the, there's a running theme that I'm always aware of, and it's the minutes turn into hours. So, even 10 minutes of something a day in a year, you've probably done 20 hours more of something mm -hmm. than somebody at home hasn't done. Yeah. And that's what sets you apart from other people, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And I'm, you know, Similar to you, I like doing things, I like learning things, I like new experiences. But then equally, there are people that do like to just sit at home and maybe watch TV and scroll on Instagram, mm. and that's equally okay. If that makes you happy, mm. that is equally okay. But I know for me, I get quite lonely, bored, and I know there's a lot more to life than sitting on my Instagram. So for me, that wouldn't work for me. But equally, it can work for for the people that yeah. makes you happy, it makes you happy. What's well, down to personal desire, isn't it? Like, mm -hmm. what is it that you want out of your life, and what is it that you want to do with your time? Like, we've all got time. Spend it how you want to spend it. Just looping back to BMR Health and Wellness, then you do online and face to face. Is that right? We do, yeah. So BMR Health and Wellbeing. Um, if you, if anyone's sort of listening and you want to sort of check us out, it's BMR healthandwellbeing.co.uk um, that is our sort of uh, page where you'll find all our training uh, about us page we do training both in person so I go out to organisations and deliver sort of suicide first aid and also the mental health first aid England courses um, but also online as well which is which is great you know it's I've met some Amazing people from all over the world. You know, I've done some training from people from Mexico, from the US, from all over the globe and bringing people together how we can nowadays, you know, on, on these sort of platforms. It's incredible. And I think, you know, it was tricky during the pandemic, but Mental Health First Aid England adapted the courses so we could continue to to um to one support people but also, you know, teach people those sort of basic skills. Uh, so that we've, we've carried on doing that online. So do both, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a massive network around the world now since COVID, since the pandemic, because people are less afraid to connect worldwide. We've all got different needs. Yeah. But I think it's given people the flexibility to be able to save time. You know, you'd sit commuting, uh, going into the office for a meeting or traipsing around London or, where, you know, a, a city, wherever. And you get that time back, but then equally it can be quite challenging if you're just back to back meetings, sitting in your living room or your, your desk at home, not connecting with people. I think that's you've got to find a balance. For me personally, yeah, I like that. No, I agree. we are less restricted. Is the word I was looking for? We're less restricted in what we mm. would have done before the pandemic. 
yeah. there's so much more opportunities. And connection is all around positive psychology. Um, there was something put together by Action for Happiness around positive psychology. So pretty much some of the stuff we used to teach, Gordon, you know, mm-hmm. it's about, you know, stepping outside your comfort zone and having a purpose. And uh, But one of the ones that on there, 10, ten keys to sort of happier living is that positive psychology of connecting, connecting with people. You know, sometimes it is nice to sort of be alone, but it is, it is proving that yeah. we connect. We're, we're human beings. We need to connect with people. Brill. Well, thank you for taking the time to connect with us today, Anne. It has been amazing to catch up. And I'm sure our listeners have taken away some great advice and help from today as well. Don't forget, everyone, you can also subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss an episode. And you can keep the conversation going over on the Facebook page, Gordy Camp TV, or on Instagram and threads at Gordy Camp. So until next time. Look after yourself and others, and we will see you soon. Thanks, guys.